All right, it is 3.30 here in Chicagoland, so it's time for us to get started uh, with our webinar this afternoon. I'm Betsy Hill, president of Brainware Learning Company, and I'm delighted that you're here with me this afternoon. Um, just a few housekeeping notes as we get started. We are recording this webinar so that if you have colleagues, I'm pretty sure we're recording. Yes, we're recording, okay. I always like to double check so I don't mess that up. Anyway, recording. So um, if you have colleagues who are interested in watching this, uh, there will be uh, a recording archive um, that will be available um, either later today or sometime tomorrow. Um, so you can check that out. I did post a link to download the slides into the chat window. Um, if you have any difficulty with that, just um, uh, put a note in there or send us an email. You'll have my email information later and we're happy to send you that link or send you a copy as well. Um, if you uh, signed up when you registered to receive a certificate of participation, um, that will automatically get processed for all of the attendees today. Um, don't panic if you don't see it uh, right away. Sometimes depending on the number of attendees, it does take us a few days usually to process that. So I would say if you don't see them uh, within a week, if you don't see your certificate, um, please get back in touch with us and, and we'll fix that. Sometimes those emails uh, seem to have a magnetic force that takes them into people's spam folders. So check your spam or your junk mail folder before you, um, before you give up on it anyway. Um, as we go along today, please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box or into the chat window, either one. We will check them um, periodically and then at the end and hopefully we'll have time for questions. So, time to go ahead and, uh, and get started. So this is our agenda for today. We're gonna to take a quick look at the persistent gaps nationally in reading and math achievement. We're going to hopefully acknowledge that the gaps reflect persistent inequities and ask some questions about the nature of those inequities. We're going to examine the cognitive impact of poverty. Um, we're going to examine how our education system traditionally addresses these issues. And then we're gonna suggest a different approach to narrowing and closing both the cognitive gap and the achievement gap. Most of you are familiar probably with the general conclusions, if not the specifics of the most recent report, um, report card for our US education system. This comes from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And if you just Google that and um, go to the uh, Department of Education's website, there's tons of information. You can slice and dice data just about however you would like to be able to do that. Um, but when you do, what you will see is that the results are largely unchanged from previous years. Average reading scores are actually down some at both fourth and eighth grades. And most relevant to our discussion today, the gaps for some key subgroups have really not changed at all in many, many years. This chart shows the gap in reading for students who are economically disadvantaged, then that uh, the students are identified uh, by being eligible for the National School Lunch Program. So when you see on the, um, this, this title, NSLP, of course, that's the National School Lunch Program eligibility. And as you can see, the gap has been the same um, or even a little bit wider for years and years and years. The same is true for students with disabilities. Um, in fact, it has widened again. And that's been true since the last century. The gap is uh, still persistent for students who are English language learners, although it has improved slightly over the last year or so. The same is true in math. Math scores track the reading score trend, although there might be a slight uptick for the fourth grade uh, in math in 2019 but eighth grade is down again. So 
again, very, very little change uh, in terms of the impact and in terms of what we're achieving overall with students across the board. And the gaps are still there as well. It's really hard to tell the difference whether you're looking at the reading gap or the math gap uh, for economically disadvantaged students, which is what this uh, graph shows. Um, again, it's persistent. Um, it has been since uh, pretty much since it's been measured. The, true, the same is true um, for students with disabilities. The gap is a little bit smaller here, but follows very much the same pattern as it does in reading. And lastly, the story is essentially the same for English language learners as well. Although as in reading, there was some slight improvement, some, some a little bit of narrowing of the gap here. So the gaps are stubborn, they're frustrating, and they have led to a more intense focus on many of the factors that might be at the root of these differences in achievement. And the concept of equity is front and center in many states. So examining why these achievement gaps persist um, leads to a thought process that says there must be something that is unequitable uh, in terms of the kinds of things that might have an impact on that achievement. And so many school districts, many schools, many educators are really taking a hard look at those. And a variety of factors are being identified as likely playing a role in the disparities. So experienced teachers, for example, have often been placed in higher performing schools in better neighborhoods. In general, schools in more affluent neighborhoods spend more per pupil. Uh, researchers have discovered disparities in technology. Early childhood development is receiving a lot of attention because children who grow up in ec economically disadvantaged communities are less well prepared when they walk through the door on that first day of kindergarten. Racial and cultural bias is also receiving a lot of attention with some pretty dramatic differences between discipline rates and things like that for black and white students, which point to a, a need to address um, issues of implicit bias. Uh, violence and other adverse childhood experiences are another factor that are often discussed as important in assuring equity of access uh, in education. Today, I want to discuss a factor that I believe is absolutely critical to addressing um, these issues in the context of ensuring equity, and that is missing in most of the dialogue on the subject of equity. And that deals with cognitive skills. What we believe is missing in all of this conversation to a large degree is an understanding of the cognitive gaps that are at the root of the achievement gaps that we see only too clearly. So this chart depicts the cognitive infrastructure for learning. Schools focus on that second tier down in this chart. They focus on reading, on math, and increasingly on social and emotional learning. But each student's capacity to access these instructional experiences is different. Learning requires well-functioning foundational cognitive skills, for example, which is the very bottom of this chart. Things like attention and visual processing, auditory processing, processing speed. These are the basic ways information gets into our brains from the outside world, and they operate at a non-conscious level. So if these skills, if these mental processes or cognitive skills are working accurately and efficiently, we get a good start to the learning process. That information gets in, it gets in intact and whole and in the right order and all those kinds of things, and we can actually start the learning process. But if not, then there's likely to be a gap in what is taken in from the learning environment and what is perceived and what is understood and what is held for further processing. So even at this basic level, there are disparities and then there are inequities in terms of students' access and ability to take in all of this information. Learning also requires that next tier up 
well-functioning executive functions. And it's important to understand that executive functions relate not just to self-control and behavior, but to every aspect of learning. So most teachers we find today are now aware of the term executive functions, and they know they're important, which is great. They tend to think of them as self-control, as self-management, but there's more to those executive functions than that. Executive functions include working memory, which is our ability to hold information, information in our minds while we think about it. Um, cognitive flexibility, our ability to shift mindsets or adapt to our environment as it changes, as well as inhibitory control, which is the executive function probably most closely connected, most obviously connected to self-control. And while education often focuses on executive functions because of the obvious connection to behavior, we would like to have our students cooperating and uh, managing themselves well and their relationships with others in the classroom. But let's spend a moment just seeing also how they operate in academics. So these are the same mental processes, whether it's academic or whether it's social emotional, just in a different context. So for example, in working memory, um, when we hold information, um, different aspects of a problem in mind, um, in math or in any other kind, any of the sciences where we're solving a problem and holding multiple pieces of information, when in math, we're keeping track of where we are in a multi-step solution. In reading comprehension, uh, working memory is absolutely critical. If you think about what happens when you're reading, you're taking in pieces of information, you're holding them in your mind while you think about them, while you relate them to what you already know, which is how you actually understand and give it meaning. And all of that happens in working memory. Working memory is our only conscious processing. So whatever it is we're thinking about, whether it's reading or math or how we feel about somebody else's opinion or which the, all of the different ways that we might respond to that person, that is all happening in working memory, regardless of whether it's academic or a social situation. Inhibitory control again, is um, the ability to suppress a thought or idea, to refrain from doing something we might otherwise do and screening out irrelevant stimuli. Um, so in, in an academic context, when we're in reading or math, not leaping to the first possible solution, but questioning assumptions. Um, being able to do that is going to affect reading accuracy and fluency. We're going to be less likely to blurt out words that aren't the appropriate thing or to uh, confuse words and, um, and things like that. Social emotional is probably the context we're most familiar. So we don't punch people in the nose when we get mad at them if we have an appropriate amount of inhibitory control. Uh, but poor focus, blowing out the candles on somebody's birthday cake would also be things that uh, inhibitory control should be able to take care of, but doesn't always, of course, in our classrooms. In terms of cognitive flexibility, this is the ability in an academic context to shift our mindset when um, and look for alternative approaches to a problem when our first approach doesn't work. We might need to look at different points of view or to change direction on the basis of new information. We probably all know uh, people who are better at it than worse at it than in when they get new information. Some people just stick to the same uh, pathway. Um, and even basic, shifting between basic cognitive processes and, and processes in our brains, such as going in between sounding out words and sight words, which are two different brain processes, requires cognitive flexibility and the ability to shift back and forth. And of course, we use these as well in a social setting, looking at personal experiences. So all of these executive functions are critical, both for learning and for the kinds of uh, self-management and management of relationships with others that we um, expect from and need to have our students 
exhibiting in um, a school situation. Oops, those were backwards a little bit. So when we see a student with weakness in one of these executive functions, when we see a weakness in attention, when we see a weakness in uh, working memory, we see a weakness in cognitive flexibility or other cognitive skills. And when we also acknowledge that it, it is interfering with their academic progress, we call it a learning disability. And when we do that, we set, put into motion a series of approaches that are called a lot of different things, 504 plans, IEPs, interventions, supports, resources, RTI, MTSS, we got a lot of different uh, ways to express it. And we'll come back to this in a few minutes. The point for now is that we have a label for this and that we have in our education system some traditional ways of approaching it. But what are we gonna do when this applies to a large group of students, to whole groups of students, to whole classrooms of students? Now what we're going to do is take a little look at some of the research and a little bit of neuroscience to help give it some context. So our brains are made up of cells called neurons, about 85 billion of them. And these are the cells that connect and communicate with each other um, and that are really the basis of all of our behavior, all of our thinking, everything that, that uh, we do. And this is an illustration of that, of how neurons um, are structured and how they connect to each other. So each neuron has an axon that sends an electrical and then a chemical signal to the dendrites of other neurons. The dendrites cover the cell's surface and receive the, the chemical signal and translate that into a, um, an electrical signal. And the place where those two connect, where the axon and the dendrites connect, is called the synapse. So you'll often hear about neurons connecting at synapses. And this communication, these electrical and chemical signals that activate neurons within neural networks are the basis of all human behavior. All of these connections among neurons in the brain make up what is sometimes referred to as gray matter. So this always makes me think of Agatha Christie and her a Belgian detective, El Cuparo, um, using his little gray cells as he thinks about a murder mystery. So um, all of those connections, the neurons and the, um, all the connections among them make up what is called gray matter in our brains. And you can see, however, that the, um, or see also that the axon of one of these cells is covered with these little looks like little lynx sausages or something like that. But that's actually a coating on the, brain, on, the, um, on the axon that's called myelin. And myelin is a fatty coating that speeds up the electrical signal that travels down the axon. And so the more a particular pathway is used, the more that, that uh, neuron is activated and communicates to other neurons, the stronger that comes and the, the thicker that myelin sheath develops as the pathway is used over and over again. And myelin is also referred to as white matter. So gray matter and white matter both develop as we interact with our environment, as our brains grow, we increase the amount of connections, the gray matter, we increase the strength of those connections, the white matter. And so of course this makes, um, a big difference in the efficiency and our ability to um, create ideas and think and solve problems and all of that. The reason this is important is we want to understand that before we take a look at some of the research that has been coming out on the impact of poverty on the brain. This is a chart from a study um, conducted by Jamie Hansen at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In this study, uh, MRIs were used to measure the amount of gray matter in the brains of children. So remember gray matter, measuring that is like countering the number of connections in the brain. The more connections, the more ways we have to, to think about things and the more knowledge we have and the more um, interconnected our brains are. 
In this study, um, it was related to socioeconomic status, and that was total family income in this case. And for these subjects, it ranged from 4% to 400% of the federal poverty level, so quite a range. And what the researchers found was more gray matter by volume in the brains of children from higher SES and less in those from lower SES. It turns out also that this was true of white matter, which is that myelin coating that we mentioned before. So higher SES is co correlated both with more neuronal connections and more efficient connections. In another study, Joan Luby of Washington University in St. Louis published um, in, the, in JAMA, the Journal of the Medi American Medical Association, also used MRI scans of children from different socioeconomic levels. Um, this slightly different measure of income, the income to needs ratio, where the total family income was divided by the federal poverty level uh, based on family size. And the study was designed to measure the contribution of that ratio to brain volume. And as in the other study that we just talked about, both gray matter and white matter volume correlated uh, with this measure of socioeconomic status. And there were some other really important findings from this research and the Hansen research, which is that the differences in gray matter volume were particularly evident in certain parts of the brain. One of the areas of the brain where the differences were significant in these MRI scans was the hippocampus. And that's that little yellow highlighted, looks like um, sort of a worm or something like that. Um, it's Greek for um, seahorse and uh, the Greeks apparently thought that looked like a little seahorse. At any rate, this is a, a tremendously important structure in the brain because it's involved in short-term memory storage and retrieval and in the consolidation of long-term memory. So memory formation is highly, of new memory, is highly dependent on the hippocampus. And so this research saw differences in hippocampal volume. So children from higher SES had more hippocampal volume more volume in the area of the brain that's responsible for creating new memory than students from lower SES. So just think about what that might mean and what we might observe as educators for children in whom the part of the brain that helps encode memory is less well developed. The University of Wisconsin study also measured differences in other parts of the brain and found dif differences in volume, gray matter and white matter volume, in uh, the, particularly the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. So I've, it's a little bit shaded in green here. The frontal lobes, of course, are important for executive functions, including um, functions like planning, impulse control, control of emotions, control of attention, and the parietal lobes play an important role in sensory integration, aspects of visual attention, and maybe especially important for connectivity among brain regions. So getting all those different parts of the brains working together. So based on all this research, there's clearly a difference that brains are physically impacted by socioeconomic status. But what does that really mean? And we've talked about what the roles of some of these are, but how does that play out um, in terms of how well our brains are actually able to carry out these functions? So this is research on uh, the connection of neurostatic socioeconomic status to cognitive processes. Uh, this is research by Kimberly Noble and um, her colleagues. Uh, there's been quite a lot of research that they've done in this area. Um, and this research, uh, published in Developmental Science, documented differences across multiple brain systems for low socioeconomic status students. And once again, significant differences were found in the areas of cognitive processing 
associated with executive functions, but also in some other areas. So consider the impact on an economically disadvantaged student of not being able to perceive visual spatial relationships and patterns as well as their more advantaged classmates. Consider what it means to have less efficient system to form new memories. We talked about the hippocampus, that is to learn. This echoes those findings regarding hippocampal volume that we just looked at in those brain scan studies. Uh, consider the impact of having more limited working memory, which we use to solve problems and manipulate information consciously. And finally, what will be the impact of having less well-developed inhibitory control? So these cognitive processes are truly the foundation for learning, and we would expect these differences to be related directly to achievement differences between students from economically disadvantaged families and their more advantaged peers. So now I want to do is share some um, information that we have gathered over the last few years in terms of our research on this topic. Um, we do a lot of work with schools with high proportions of students living in poverty. And over these last few years, we've had an opportunity to administer cognitive assessments to, um, in, to many of them. And based on what you've heard, what would you expect to see uh, in terms of some differences in executive functions that relate to family income? Okay, let's take a look. What we're looking at here is the percentage of students in different schools who score at least one standard deviation below the mean for attention and or working memory. So in a range where we know that they are going to need support to access the instructional experiences that they're exposed to. In a middle class suburban school, so starting at the very left on this chart, um, you can see that a little less than a third of the students fell in that range. If you look at the other end, that pink bar on the very right, those are students that we tested in um, a special ed school, school that was designed specifically for uh, students who um, are receiving special education services. And you can see that at that end, 98%. And in fact, this is, um, there are a number of schools that are part of this network, and in many of them, it's 100%. So we're gonna see that uh, those very high levels because, as we know, these are skills that are going to impact a child's ability to learn and their ability to take in information, to learn, uh, to attend to it, to inhibit uh, uh, inaccurate information and responses. And then in between, you see a variety of other schools. Uh, there's an urban elementary school, um, that is uh, very near the suburbs at 48%, uh, a private at-risk school um, that's a residential school for children from poverty at 60%, about the same in an urban public school. Um, and then you get to some of the urban charter schools that we've been working with. Um, and I make particular note of the um, so it looks like a light blue, grayish blue bar at 90%, which is uh, the current third grade class in an urban charter school in Minnesota. And what I wanna point out is that, which is hopefully what you're seeing and concluding on your own as well, is that for, in some of these schools, overwhelming proportions of students that are uh, in areas of poverty look a lot like students with special needs. Does that mean we should classify them as special ed? What would that look like? Let's hold that question for a moment. We looked first at executive functions because we know how, about the, that high correlation um, to learning and because those differences are so striking and because they stand out in the research that those are the areas that are particularly vulnerable to poverty and likely to be impacted by them. But in other areas of processing, we may see differences, but the pattern is not as consistent. 
So for example, here are the results of that same testing in those same schools and same kids for verbal reasoning and abstract reasoning. The differences are marked, but not as extreme um, on the verbal reasoning subtest. And that makes sense. We actually would expect um, some of these high poverty schools to have students who uh, struggle with verbal reasoning or not as strong in that area. Um, that echoes research from Hart and Risley and other things we know about the development of language, how many words you've heard, and all that kind of thing. And I would also point out that the urban charter school in Minneapolis, um, which is that 68% um, bar on the verbal reasoning, is a uh, high proportion, almost 100% English language learners. Um, and actually the um, urban public school, the other high bar is, is also has a high population of ELL. But if we then we look at over at the um, uh, abstract reasoning, the non-language based reasoning, we see many schools that are very comparable uh, that where the differences between uh, um, the suburban school, the more affluent school and the higher poverty schools is negligible. Um, where the differences are much, much smaller and, and really in some cases never, not really much of a difference at all. So this is not about genetic intelligence. This is about the impact of poverty on the development of some key cognitive processes that will affect learning and behavior. So then the question becomes, what do we do about it? So now think back to what we talked about, the things that we put in motion when we diagnose a learning disability, when we know that a child has one. And I call this the old way because we now have a different way to address cognitive skills. And we're gonna talk about that. But the old way essentially is to bypass the cognitive processes that are weak in order to minimize the impact of those processing deficits. What exactly does that mean? The old way strategies fall into three main categories, accommodations, modifications to the curriculum, and compensatory strategies. Most of you are familiar with accommodations. These include things like providing additional time for a student to complete a test or to finish an assignment, maybe assistance taking notes, providing verbal instructions for those students who might struggle with written instructions and vice versa, written for those who don't process as well auditorily. We might provide different seating in the classroom to help a student not be as distracted or to make sure that they can hear or see or whatever it might be. Uh, we might have a student take a lot of breaks that's very common also for students with limited attention skills um, or structured study halls and, and things like that where they provide, um, receive a lot of support. And there are, of course, other examples, but these are pretty typical of what um, might be found in uh, an individualized education plan or other kind of uh, support system. When it comes to curriculum modifications, um, you probably also experienced these. Uh, additional instruction, uh, so breaking things down a little bit, providing a more simple explanation, taking it a little bit slower, uh, shorter, simpler instructions, more explicit connection to prior knowledge and more scaffolding. Same uh, idea really as breaking it up. We often will see text written at a lower grade level, um, books with pictures uh, that, that are intended to help students uh, comprehend or get the information that's in the, in the textbook. Uh, less work, so fewer spelling words, fewer math problems. Um, and in general, any progress versus expected progress. So we want to, um, we often experience in these kinds of situations targets for growth that are simply some kind of incremental improvement 
rather than actually helping students uh, get back up to grade level and the kind of progress they should be experiencing at that level. The third area, the last old way, uh, relies heavily on strategies to help a student. And um, here's a very specific example. So if we have a child who has limited working memory, um, they probably have difficulty remembering a set of instructions. So if I'm uh, Johnny's teacher, I, and Johnny I know has uh, a hard time holding on to instructions in working memory, instead of saying, well, if I happen to say, take off your hat, pick up your homework folder, and take your seat in the reading circle, what might very well happen is that Johnny gets to um, his hat off and maybe gets to retrieve his homework folder and then may look around as if he is completely lost. And that's simply because those instructions are not something that um, he has been able to hold on to in his mind. It's not that he wasn't listening. It's not that he's being oppositional. I mean, it could be, but generally not. It simply means that those instructions are just gone. Um, and if you think about some of your own experiences where you've been looking for something and got distracted and then you have to think to yourself, well, what was I doing? Sometimes we can remember that, but sometimes we don't until, until later. And that's um, the same kind of thing, except that it happens over and over and over again all the time in pretty much just about every activity that these kids engage in. Checklists, tutoring, breaking things down, reteaching, graphic organizers, all kinds of other things come into play here. And teachers are then taught to break things down and give those directions one at a time. Go hang up your hat, and they wait till he hangs up his hat. Now get your reading folder. Now he gets his reading folder. So he's getting those things all in uh, pieces so that he can hold on to them which is important. I'm, I don't want to say that there's no room for any of these accommodations or any of these other um, strategies. They may be necessary um, simply to provide the child with access to the instructional experience for a period of time, but they're not really going to change um, the ultimate ability to access uh, all of the richness and all of the um, instructional experience that they could. So once again, accommodations, curriculum modifications, compensatory strategies are the old way. And their purpose again is to bypass those cognitive skills. We're going to work around weak working memory. We're going to work around poor attention. We're going to work around poor inhibitory control. We're going to work around visual processing issues. And really what we're doing is we're giving them these techniques to minimize the impact and they're really crutches. Now there's a purpose for crutches. Several years ago, I broke my ankle and I was told not to put weight on that foot. I used crutches for several weeks, but I don't still use crutches. After my bone healed, I had physical therapy to help me regain the ability to walk normally and without crutches. So all of these old ways of dealing with learning disabilities and uh, uh, deficits in executive functions are essential to enable them to access the instructional experience we provide for them as long as they truly need them. And at the same time, we need to be thinking about these situations in the same context we do if it was, if it was a physical disability where we, try, we provide therapy and remediation. Unfortunately, in our world, once a student receives these kinds of supports, our system assumes that they need them forever. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons it's often so hard to get these supports in the first place, because the assumption is that they will have to have them forever, and that the, there's certainly a lot of cost and um, effort that's involved in providing them. It turns out that that's not always such a good assumption. And recently, a colleague shared this story with me. Um, it was a 17-year-old high school student who went into, I believe it was a college admissions test, 
Uh, and he was entitled to accommodations, but he rejected them. Um, he chose uh, not to receive those accommodations, any extra time or anything, um, even though he'd had them for years and years and years. And his thought process was that, and he'd been doing this actually for a, a couple of year or two at this point. And what he said was, all my life, I've been getting everything modified, adapted, or adjusted. And finally, I realized that the world, when I got out into the real world, I wasn't going to be getting any of those supports, any of those crutches. I wouldn't have extra time to complete an assignment. I wouldn't have someone to translate instruction into simpler words. And so he realized that he needed to develop the skills to do the things uh, that he would be asked to do. And he voluntarily threw away his crutches. But it was hard. He said, they've been telling me all my life that I needed those crutches. Now, it turned out that he is doing quite well now and that he didn't need them. But when you're told over and over again throughout your life that you need the crutches, it's very difficult to make that transition. And in this case, there had never been any serious consideration of what skills this child could develop or how he could manage without the instructions. The IEP said he needed them, he got them. So now a little bit about the new way. The new way is to actually strengthen the cognitive processes and the executive functions that are weaker as well as those that are already strong so that we can optimize learning capacity, not work around weaker skills. And here's how that works. The cognitive training results I'm going to share with you have used a tool called Brainware Safari, um, which has taken the best practices of multiple disciplines of uh, therapy from speech pathology to vision development to neurology and psychology and has incorporated them into a computer-based program. It comprehensively develops the skills that we've been talking about in that pyramid, foundational cognitive skills as well as executive functions. And what I'm going to share is some research on the program's uh, impact on students' cognitive capacity and how that translates to academic performance. As we discuss the research, I want you to keep in mind that the usage of the program that delivers these kinds of results is three to five times a week for about 12 weeks. So let's first look at those students with learning disabilities. Um, and that was the, the subject of the, uh, the population that was uh, the um, uh, the participants in this study. So in this case, um, students had been, were selected, they had been diagnosed with, in their, uh, with learning disabilities, so they were receiving the standard reading and math interventions and supports that they were entitled to in their school. The researcher divided them into a control, randomly into a control group and a study group. The control group were receiving their reading and math interventions. The Brainware group received those plus cognitive training with Brainware. Uh, the pre and the post test in this case was the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive battery. And the scores were translated into a proficiency index. And all that really means is that 90% is the performance, the proficiency index that would be expected of a normally developing student. And so you can so that's that top bar in this graph. And you can see by looking at the lighter bars, the results of the pretest, that these students were performing at about 63, 64% proficiency on the pretest. And that makes perfect sense. We know that by definition, a specific learning disability means a deficit in one of those underlying cognitive processes. And so in fact, that is exactly what it looks like. And it's, there's a pretty big gap between 63, 64% and 90%. You can see after 12 weeks, there was little change for the control group, but the brainware group after 12 weeks, three times a week of cognitive training, on average scored at 89% for proficiency, 
So almost closing the gap to what would be considered normally developing. And then you can see also the impact that it had on progress in reading and math. Rather than little incremental steps in reading, once we remediate these underlying skills, they can perform reading tasks, math tasks, and acquire the skills and knowledge much more quickly. So in these 12 weeks, the students who had the cognitive training improved their reading by eight tenths of a grade equivalent and a full grade equivalent in math. The researcher also broke this down into some of the subtest areas within the uh, Woodcock-Johnson cognitive assessment. And so that's what you're seeing here. And here's where we connect it back very, very directly to those areas that we've talked about as being essential to verbal working memory, to short-term memory, to attention skills. And you can see that in each of those areas, these children with the appropriate kind of cognitive training are getting the skills up very close to sometimes surpassing the level that would be considered normally developing. I want to give you another example. And this time, instead of students with learning disabilities, these are students from economically disadvantaged communities. This is uh, what you're seeing here is a group of fourth and fifth grade boys um, who had a history of behavior issues and were all in one particular school in Indianapolis a few years ago. Um, what you're seeing with the bars is their performance on uh, the cognitive test. Here it's represented in age equivalents. So what this means is you, these um, boys were, as you can see, about 10 to the oldest was 14. <clears throat> um, and so the, um, but they were performing significantly below that in terms of their cognitive performance. Uh, on average, three years behind. So when we talk about, when we hear about children from disadvantaged backgrounds performing, being behind, lagging by a couple or three years, it's not just academically, it's also in many, many cases cognitively, as you can see here. And so um, this is what this population looked at like um, uh, before their cognitive training. This is what it looked like after their cognitive training. So all the students improved in their cognitive ability, most surpassing what we would be expected of students their age. These were not dumb kids. They had potential, but what they didn't have was the developed cognitive capacity to succeed in school. They didn't have some of those executive functions and other cognitive processing skills that they need. Um, I should point out there was not a control group in this study, but other studies with control groups um, have shown that um, these differences are, um, uh, and these changes are quite significant and very consistent um, across the board when Brainware Safari is used as the cognitive training, um, and anywhere between two to six years um, of improvement over those 12 weeks. This is another, um, uh, piece of research um, that looks looked at, um, in this case, there wasn't a cognitive assessment. We just have academic data. The academic data here was on a formative assessment called GRADE. So it's a sort of comprehensive reading assessment. It evaluates um, fluency, comprehension, um, syntax, vocabulary. Um, so a number of different aspects of reading and language. And um, what we're seeing here is the difference between the performance on this test uh, for a group of students in the fourth grade and then the following year in their fifth grade year. The two uh, bars across show what the fourth and fifth grade norms are. Uh, very small incremental change is expected between fourth and fifth grade. If you look at the two bars on the left, you look at all of the students as a group what you're going to see is that these students were performing above grade level in their reading in fourth grade, and they're performing even more above grade level in fifth grade. So everybody feels pretty good about and this, and in fact, is a school in a reasonably high-performing district. 
However, when we separate them out into groups, we start to hear a very different story and one that will sound familiar, I think, to most teachers. When you separate the students who are doing really well from those who are struggling, you can see the core, core means performing at or above grade level, below core, below grade level. When we separate those out, we see that real disparity between those two groups. We've got kids who are doing great and we have kids who are really struggling. And that is very common in classrooms. But look at the change following their, tra their cognitive training. So the core group improved by eight points. And the below core group improved by 18. So now they, instead of performing below gravel, they're performing well comfortably above the level that would, is grade level performance uh, and certainly closer to their other peers. The same happened with the students who had IEPs, um, significant performance and uh, now performing significantly uh, above grade level and FR is free and reduced lunch. So those are the students um, who are doing pretty well. They're actually performing at grade level in fourth grade, but now significantly above and starting to narrow the gap to um, their more advantaged peers. Uh, this is uh, data from that uh, Minneapolis Urban Charter School that I referenced earlier. Uh, this is not this year's data because they're still uh, working through this year. This is from their fifth grade last year. And what you're seeing here is the results of the pre and the post test uh, using a cognitive assessment called MindPrint. One of the things, and what you're seeing some really nice improvements, an overall improvement of 21 percentile points on average across all of these different areas. Um, you can see nice improvements in working memory and flexible thinking. Uh, not much change here in, in this particular group in attention, uh, but nice improvements across reasoning skills and other areas. This was an implementation which did not actually follow the uh, recommended protocol um, instead of three times a week, that was about twice a week. This year they're implementing it with far more fidelity and it'll be fascinating to see it. But this starts to show that even uh, without perfect implementation, we can have quite an impact on performance across many different cognitive skills. Wanted to share just one uh, or two more studies with you that really starts to, to reinforce yeah, the number of different types of populations that we can see this. This is another uh, low SES group of students, lagging readers, um, that were tested uh, before and after 12 weeks apart um, using uh, cognitive training in between. And you can see the tremendous growth that we're seeing in sentence fluency and word fluency and math fluency. Uh, so those were actually Woodcock-Johnson tests. And then uh, this particular school uses Fontas and Pinnell reading levels. Uh, the expected improvement over a year for students is three Fontas and Pinnell reading levels. And as you can see that every student uh, in this group improved at least um, one reading level during these 12 weeks, so about on track. Many improved significantly more of that. Two thirds of them improved four reading levels. So more than a year's worth of growth in those 12 weeks. And one student suddenly discovered reading, was totally transformed and bounced up uh, 10 reading levels, couldn't keep him out of the library. Um, this is another um, group of students uh, who were used brainware uh, and cognitive training. This is a Title I school in Florida. Um, they were selected, the students were selected by the principal and the learning specialist. So we know that these students were substantially behind in reading and math. Um, and we, so we didn't do a cognitive assessment in this case, but we can look at some academic data from the iReady tests that were administered. Um, so iReady, as some of you may know, projects a typical growth target and a stretch growth target for each student. So the stretch goal 
is a goal that would enable the student to close the gap toward expected grade level performance. So in reading, after this training, 41% of the students had already met their annual growth target in January, halfway through the year. Um, a couple of students had even met their stretch growth target at that time. Almost two thirds of the students were on track to meet or had already met their annual growth target. So in my experience, these are pretty, pretty darn good results for students who are mostly um, uh, ESE or special ed students, um, as well as living in economically disadvantaged community. Almost half the students are on track to meet their stretch growth target. In other words, to narrow or close the gap um, academically. And the results were very similar for math for these students. A reminder that cognitive skills support everything that we do, not just reading. We don't have two separate brains for reading and math and everything else. We have one brain that we take on every journey with us in our lives. So when we understand the cognitive infrastructure we need for learning, and when we appreciate what a role it plays in the achievement gap for students with learning disabilities and for students from low SES, and when we think differently about how to address these differences in a way that actually develops students' capacity to access and benefit from the learning experiences we provide for them, it may be that we have to address cognitive development truly as a matter of equity. So I'm going to stop here <clears throat> and see if there are any questions. Um, I'm going to see if I can check the chat window in the Q&A. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask Karen if she is there. Can you hear me? I can. Great. There's um, a couple of questions. Dee um, asked a question, but I think you answered it. Um, what learning strategies do you recommend for strengthening the short-term memory? Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. You were not as sort of uh, not as clear. What learning strategies do you recommend for strengthening the short-term memory? Okay, well, short-term memory is one of those cognitive skills that is very challenging to remediate. <clears throat> what we tend to do in terms of strategies is to provide substitutes for actually developing short-term memory. So the kinds of things that um, will actually, you know, we, we have kids write things down, we have them make notes, we have them do other kinds of things. In terms of short-term memory, we also need to know some other things. We need to know some things about whether the, it's all types of short-term memory or whether it's different for verbal and uh, visual information, very often there's a disconnect. In those cases um, where, where somebody has much stronger visual memory or, or than verbal memory or vice versa, my verbal skills are much better than my visual skills. And so when I need to remember something that I've seen, um, I have to put it into language. So I will say things to myself. I might turn it into, if I see a yellow triangle, so there's a yellow triangle on the top left, and then there's something that looks like a trash can on the bottom right. And when I put it into language, that helps you remember it. And for students who are the other way around, and we work with a lot of them, then we can switch that around. We're going to take language-based information and turn it into pictures, have them draw it, have them create images of it, have them focus really on visualizing. And so we want to do that. In terms of actually strengthening the brain's ability to hold on to information in the short term, both um, just for the, the time to be able to recall it, as well as to manipulate it and think about it in working memory, then some kind of um, intensive cognitive training, as we've talked about, is really uh, the only way I know to uh, really get those skills up to the level where they can be um, relied on and, and don't require those adaptations and strategies. So it's possible to do that, it's, um, um, but it, it does take work for sure. 
We have another question. Do you get these results from adults or adults also? Was the question about whether we see this in adults as well? Yes. <laughs> yep. You know, uh, all adults were children once and all children become adults at some point in time, we hope. And so absolutely, the we know that our brains are plastic throughout life. That's the term that the neuroscientists use to mean that they can change. Um, it refers to the fact that we're constantly growing new and strengthening connections among those neurons in our brain. That's what actually neuroplasticity means. And so that happens throughout our lives. We can learn throughout our lives and we can change our um, cognitive functioning throughout our lives. It is certainly easier when we are younger than when we are older. Um, but we have worked with a lot of individuals who are older um, who have improved. Now we don't typically give them reading and math tests, but what we do here are things like um, after cognitive skills are strengthened for adults, we hear things like, um, I, I'm, I can keep track of my day better. I keep track of my projects and my tasks better. Uh, we had one woman who is a financial um, person, the head of a company actually, she does a lot of financial work and creates invoices and things for um, the clients that they work with in the construction industry. And she started to find after doing cognitive training that she could remember the whole number and just transpose it without making a mistake. Um, we hear that uh, people are able to um, uh, remember things that they feel more alert, that they feel like they can uh, um, keep track of keep track of activities for sure is one thing. Um, so yes, the answer is, um, and we've done work with college age students, with students, with um, workers who did cognitive training as part of their training on on the job in an oil refinery, and um, in all of these areas, we see the potential to improve cognitive processes. Any other questioning? Any current research in the fields of Alzheimer's and dementia? So, um, we do not have ongoing work in those areas. We are very interested in working with older adults who are at risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, what I would say is that, I, and I say that very specifically, that we would uh, want to work with individuals who might be at risk for that. Um, because once the disease has taken hold, um, there is, no evidence that we know of today that it can be remediated. When dementia results in, um, the, basically the, the loss of connections among neurons, it's a loss of synapses. And once they're gone, they're gone. They can't, um, you may be able to form some new memories, but um, the disease is quite, uh, quite challenging. And, um, Someone's talking to me about uh, myelin sheath decay is irreparable. And yes, absolutely. Um, and so we would want to work with um, individuals pre that situation and hope to um, uh, keep their brains healthy and active for a longer period of time. Um, and uh, th so if anybody is involved in that kind of work, um, we'd love to hear from you and love to work with you. So I think we're at 4.30, um, which is our, supposed to be our stopping time, and I want to honor everybody's busy schedules. Um, is there any last question, Karen, that you saw? The program you mentioned, is, is that the only program that targets those skills? Um, someone replied for us, the Brainware program. So there are a variety of uh, programs out in the world that are based um, in 
in different ways on neuroscience and that develop um, certain cognitive skills. Brainware Safari is the most comprehensive. Uh, so it deals with the, the broadest array of cognitive skills in a way that has been demonstrated to translate into um, everyday changes in everyday activity, perform better academic performance. Great, okay. Well, if you have other questions, we certainly um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Here's my contact information. Uh, we'd love to continue the dialogue. Um, these are areas that we feel very passionately about. Uh, we think that um, the, the struggles that we have closing the gaps in education can be addressed by addressing the underlying cognitive challenges that our students have, whether they're students with disabilities, whether they're students from low income, or whatever the cause of those cognitive challenges may be, and that uh, those are critical to enabling students to access and take advantage of uh, the wonderful learning experiences that we can provide for them. So I hope you'll join us at another webinar sometime soon. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today and for joining us. And we will look forward to further conversation. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day.